Hello, everyone, and welcome to this interview of the Sacred Dance Guild series. Uh, before we begin, I invite you to join with me as we place our hands on our hearts and we take a breath together, breathing collectively. And I invite you to close your eyes and breathe together, remembering the, uh, we are one people on one planet in the one beautiful dance of life. Thank you. And welcome again. My name is Patricia Bowen Fisher. I have been a Sacred Dance Guild member since 1995. And I love the Sacred Dance Guild and what it stands for. And I enjoy watching its evolution over the years. And this year in particular, we have just finished having the most wonderful Zoom festival, bringing us into a new age and a new way of joining together in the dance. Today, we have a special program because we have been inviting people to uh, share their best ideas and their jewels of wisdom with us because after 62 years as an organization, we are uh, developing, looking at having an accreditation for Sacred Dance Guild facilitators. And so in this regard, we'd love to find out from other sacred dancers what their inspirations are and how they could help us. At first, we decided we were going to just have one-on-one -on -one interviews with these important people to help us. But then we decided that with technology and all that that helps us, that we could open it up and have people joining us in these, inter in these interview series. So it is with delight that today we have Margie Gillis. In, uh, on our 60th anniversary, she was selected along with five others to be honorary members of the guild. And uh, the, the six honorary members represent the six decades of the guild's, guild's existence. And um, we, they, these honorary members join the likes of Ted Sean, um, Jean Erdman, uh, Ruth St. Dennis, and um, many others, along with our present lovely living legacy, Carla DeSola. So today is Margie Gillis's turn to be interviewed, and I am totally delighted to do so. Um, Margie, if you say her name to people that have seen her dance live, they immediately light up in the remembrance of some beautiful performance that they witnessed. Margie has, Margie is a renowned solo dancer and she dances in groups as well. And she has choreographed more than 150 pieces. She is uh, award-winning, she has awards from all kinds of sources. She's being declared the cultural ambassador of Canada. She helps young people, she helps young dancers develop their craft and um, has a foundation to support her ongoing work in the dance world. But her dances themselves communicate so much. They communicate on levels that are hard to describe. They're it's wordless, really. And so you get this wonderful sense of being treated to wisdom and truth. And it is something that takes your breath away. In uh, the year 2000, Margie was one of our dance facilitators at the Sacred Dance Guild Festival in Ottawa, Canada. One of the people that attended that said that 
that workshop that she attended with Margie, or it was a series of workshops, changed her life. And that is the kind of thing that Margie can do in her dancing and in her teaching. So Margie is a very welcome member here today because I'm sure she has so much that she can help us learn and uh, give glimpses of uh, um, wonderful inspiration to us. Um, and just before we start talking to Margie, we would like to show an introductory film or a little video. Now, uh, videos do not get the, the juice that you get from a real live dance, but you'll get a glimmer of the wonder of Margie Gillis. Please enjoy the video. Welcome to you and thank you so much for donating your time and your talent by accepting this invitation to be with us this afternoon. To begin with, can you talk about your personal journey with sacred dance? Hi, and thank you. Um, I, I just wanted just a, a little thing about the, the clippy that you saw. Thank you so much for inviting me and having me and um, giving you, giving me the chance to speak about my passion and, um, and to share with you, um, what I love in life and what I love about life. Um, just a, a brief note about the, the, the piece that you saw that is one of many, 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 many works. So, um, uh, it's one of the later works in my repertoire and I now also have a legacy company. So please feel free to, we just, who is going to choose which of what? So uh, my office just choose, chose that bit, but you can go to my website or, or Google me or whatever, and you can see lots of stuff. Um, so if, if you're interested in seeing, uh, because it covers a broad range over, it's almost 50 years now of professional dance. So it's quite a, a broad range. So I, I, because the questions were sent to me, I did write a few notes just to make sure I'd keep track. So um, uh, about the subject of my journey with sacred dance, there's a number of elements that I felt uh, were relevant. 
And one of those elements um, to begin with is, um, is the fact that I just, I would, my mother says I came out dancing and I just love dancing. And it, something I always did, I took class, uh, I started class when I was three till I was 12 in classical dance. But basically I just danced. I never thought I would become a dancer. It was a mode of expression that I had always used. And uh, I danced to celebrate my life. I danced to feel my life. I danced to understand my life and process my life. I under danced to marvel in nuance and quality, uh, as well as uh, gross modo or, or big gesture, but nuance the quality of of being alive and what that what was the architecture of that livingness i also um had a, a, a serious nervous breakdown when i was young so dance also became a healing for me and uh, and a way out uh, ballet was not my chosen path or was not the path that was right for me because I needed to uh, let my emotion out and, and move and flow and not, um, and not uh, constrain my movement uh, to understand it more. Um, so a dance has always been a celebration. It's always been intrinsic and it's always been sacred because life is sacred and it just was that way. Um, I come from a very, very physical family, so a lot of them were involved in sport and in competition. I did not like competition. Um, I wanted a greater coming together and I wanted to understand humanity after having felt so isolated by the nervous breakdown and so inhuman. And the nervous breakdown gave me the gift, of a hard-won gift, albeit, of watching my personality disintegrate and then watching my personality reintegrate. And I think that gave me a lot of insight into what it is to be essentially human and where we come from and what we do. Um, another element that was important for me is that my great grandfather was a minister. So at our family church in Quebec, um, in Actonville, Quebec, uh, the minister there was a man named Reverend Church, and he was uh, an ecstatic. He would just, he would begin sermons and just go into these wild renditions of glory and beauty and, and listen to the birds and everybody get up and dance, and which, of course, that was thrilling to me. And often running, I would be with the dogs and the cats and whatever birds were running or flying in the church and all of us celebrating life. And all of his sermons were about love, so he was great. And of course, his wife was a wonderful, grounded, solid person to help balance and keep that going. <laughs> um, uh, so I think um, in terms of class, structure was not uh, a thing that was helpful for me. Um, uh, and both religiously and in dance, um, it, it's been more nature, it's been more the wildness and the beauty and what is authentic and what is real and what is natural within the being human. Um, and I also, so with religion, it was more spirituality and the spirituality of the body or the intimacy, the sacred of the body was really important to me. Uh, so I didn't often fit in with any kind of doctrines uh, because of that uh, movement aspect, which I'm sure you all understand very, very well. Um, then uh, the, uh, another aspect that was important to me was the decision to, to become a, a, per, a performer and a dancer and a choreographer. And it came from a... Uh, I come from a philosophical vantage point as opposed to either a choreographic or performative vantage point. And out of that central hub of curiosity about humanity and who we are in the spirit and our experiential wisdom and all of these elements, um, that, that, that is where I sort of uh, uh, grew my, my uh, my spirituality or my can my desire to communicate um, I had a vision when I was about 18 uh, Asking what I should do with the rest of my life and I heard this very very clear voice 
saying dance. And I said, well, I don't want to because there's people involved in that. And I was extremely shy. And of course, the nervous breakdown didn't make me exactly social. And um, the voice said, uh, the voice just disappeared. And, and when I woke up from this vision and this night, this dream, um, I um, knew that I was either going to run towards this vision or away from it. And it was a very decisive thing. So I thought I should uh, run towards it and just create these movements and create these dances out of philosophies and wanting to understand the human uh, being and what it was to be a human being. And um, so I, I started uh, uh, making dances and I thought it would just really fail. I was going to communicate with others and I wanted my communication to be very honest uh, very transparent and very transformative. So um, I, I did, nobody was doing what I want, what I was interested in seeing in the world. So I made these dances, thinking, okay, this is going to fail. Yippee! I'll go back to being a social worker or or um, or a kindergarten teacher or something wonderful. Who knows? And instead, the first performances were um, had a, a very deep. Uh, touch, uh, we're able to teach, touch people on a very profound level. And so they were uh, an incredible success and I've continued all these many years. Also my brother uh, danced as a professional dancer uh, with the Paul Taylor Company and with Jose Lemont in New York um, and uh, a number of others, but he was with Taylor for 18 years. Um, and he really was a dancer of excellence. Uh, he was a, 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 in, that, in that formal, traditional Apollo kind of thing, as opposed to my Dionysian. But we loved each other tremendously, and we served the purpose of sharing with each other. And he studied Gurdjieff, and was, uh, that was his religion, that was his philosophy, that was his movement orientation. Um, and uh, he worked very... Uh, much within sacred geometry, it was uh, extremely interesting to him, as was uh, sacred movement. So he had a great influence on me. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to mention um, that, that had an enormous um, influence on me um, now in my later years has been um, meeting uh, Thomas Otimo Kane, who um, gives uh, spiritual guidance. And he is not a very guru type person. He's just a lovely, sincere, clean, clear, um, scholar, kind, uh, fatherly uh, man who uh, studied with, um, uh, who was a Jungian therapist and then met Pierre Valayak and uh, became his assistant for many years with the Sufi tradition. Uh, was uh, mentored by Ralph Zalman from the Judaic tradition, the new Judaic tradition, and, um, and has worked uh, with Tibetan Buddhism and uh, um, in Bhutan and, uh, and mystical Christians. So he's, he, um, uh, I met him. Uh, he was teaching at Hollyhock where I was teaching. And we just had an incredible um, connection, just live wire. After many, many years of just crisscrossing each other because we were busy with our students. And um, so I've begun working with him more, um, involved with him uh, recently, and have started doing um, movement pieces around um, uh, the meditations he puts forward and the thing he puts forward. And right now I've been uh, very, very active working with um, uh, Thomas's imagery, um, the blue sky mind, and uh, the deep, the deep, uh, deep heart of the Sufi, the blue sky mind in the Buddha, um, being firmly planted in me there and helping people try to get through, particularly uh, dancers, get through um, what has been a, a very, uh, challenging time and certainly very um, hard for, for uh, the dance community that performs. Uh, um, all gigs are gone, money's gone, everything's gone, and I work with a lot of dancers from around the world, so um, we're not, they're not all as lucky as we are here in Canada. So, so these are all the elements that have, have come in to, to my work, and um, going on to the stage uh, for these almost 50 years 
as a performer and dealing with energy and the transformative power of, um, of communication, going from stuck to unstuck, um, from working with um, elements of energy, elements of transformation, elements of healing, um, uh, oftentimes by facing those aspects that are really challenging or difficult has been my blessing and I love it. I love it to bits. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, that's my, my pathway and my journey. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Margie. Could you repeat the name of your, um, Thomas Kane? I didn't get his middle name. Atum, A-T-U-M, that is his Sufi name, Atum. A-T-U-M. A-T-U-M, O'Kane. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. That's a wonderful, a wonderful introduction to you as a dancer. Thank you so much. Now, so the first question is, what are your thoughts on creating sacred space, indoor, outdoor, uh, site specific? Um, I think that contained and open space are both wonderful. Um, for me, uh, con contained space has a lot more to do with communication um, with the audience or with those, you know, the, uh, I, I think of proscenium and theaters and, and um, contain, it's, it's easier somehow to dance in a contained space. It's, you you are setting a, like it's a womb like structure and it's you're in space and it's it's defined whereas uh performing outdoors or performing site specific is often uh less um contained it's more expansive and open and in those situations i feel the work is more either intimate or exalted in other words you're communicating with nature you're communicating with the elements directly. And a lot of that is receiving that information. And also there's so much information flying around you from, from just all the living aspects, the, the vibrancy of, of um, so the, those are two different ways. I, I think um, uh, uh, they're not absolutes by any stretch of the imagination, but I find that performing outside is exhausting, much more exhausting because it's just so overwhelming, just the sky and the distance. Whereas if you're in a room, you've contained it, kind of bounces off the wall and holds everything together in that kind of So um, that's that's an aspect of that. Um, I, I think uh, the communication of outdoors also is about communicating more with goddess, god, nature, the living sacred so the communication is absorbing that and feeling that and drawing that in um, as well as exalting in it again just to, to, to clarify a bit more of, of what I'm, I'm talking about as opposed to doing it within structure where you're you're held where that where the idea and the, the uh, is, is held by whatever that uh, geometry or structure structure is um, so elaboration is wonderful inside I think that's elaborate detailed quality all of those uh, but outside it's it's more helpful to be simplest simple to keep it simple because nature is in its own majesty and its own demand of gorgeous beauty so so the the quality of the, the of, of the situation um, I think uh, becomes more simple, uh, is, is more helpful in, in being in communion and um, understanding the dynamics of, of those energetically. <laughs> uh, the sacred in nature and the sacred in amphitheaters or spaces that are co-created with nature, such as um, uh, dancing at the Herodoticus in, in Greece or dancing in uh, one of the big, huge amphitheaters. I had the blessing of dancing with Truly a goddess on earth, Jesse Norman, in yeah. uh, Greece, in this, the, the biggest amphitheater they have there. And it was just awe-inspiring, you know, and dancing in, in 
looking up at the Herod Atticus and looking up and, and, and just the sheet of people and then the, the uh, Acropolis on top is pretty awe-inspiring. <laughs> I'm boggling. You feel like, okay, here I am. <laughs> no, let's go. Just lose, lose all the edges, lose all the being, all, lose all the self. Go into transformation. Just get and trust the history of what you've created and and are going with. Um, I uh, the theater, the open eye. I worked with Jean Erdman in uh, <laughs> in New York uh, and Joseph Campbell. Um, I worked, I was, uh, her, their niece, uh, Leslie Dillingham was a dancer and she and I worked uh, a lot together and did performances at the Theater of the Open Eye and also worked at the church doing uh, whirling dervish work, uh, which I have not been initiated into. We just stood up and went, um, told which arm to raise, and which arm to lower and, and then did it for 45 minutes. That was, you know, it was fun for 45 minutes. That was really fun. And, uh, you know, I, I, I knew Jean and I knew uh, Joseph mainly uh, in a familial way. So when Joseph came up to me afterwards, after a performance and said, oh my gosh, do you realize what you're doing? I very blissfully said, no, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> So there we have it, a little bit on the individual side, as you, as you might well imagine, really trying to understand from uh, uh, that perspective. So, um, and of course my own uh, family church in Actonville, I dance in every summer and I'm uh, very appreciated to have that sacred space. We move out the pews and, and I create there. Um, every summer, including this summer, although it's been uh, just with one or two people and um, just one person dancing at a time, except for um, a couple couples when couples are, are, are and it's, uh, there's a big family rectory that is owned by my family, so it, it, it can house up to 18 people, so spatial distancing for three is not a hard thing to do there. Uh, but um, so uh, I think that we are sacred and we are profane. Uh, we can transform space, but there are also places around the world that have been understood to be extraordinary, either through nature or in co-creation with nature. And um, all of these are just uh, profound and wonderful. Uh, there are places that I've found on my own that just, you know, that a tree will be under a tree at just the right angle and the tree is in just this beautiful state of being, whether it's whatever season it happens to be in, that there's just moments of grace that you find places and can do those dances. So I often dance in nature for my own soul's sake. <laughs> yes. Yeah. To replenish and renew and be in communion with more of my work has been performative as in the larger theaters. I've, I've done every kind of theater you can imagine from 45,000 people. I think that there are more, more when I worked with Jesse, we, we did uh, St. John the Divine as well. And um, uh, so, so really it's just when I've been, I've been everywhere from little cellars and little boats to to uh, stages, small stages outdoors that have got holes in them, to, to huge um, opera houses, Lincoln Center, this sort of thing. So it's really been a full range. Um, and I think that it is important in sacred spaces. Sacred spaces can touch us and impress on us, but we can also walk into space with our own sacredness or with our questions for sacredness are reaching, are sensing for it, are, are pushing out ourselves into this space, um, feeling for it. And just that activity uh, is, is thrilling and can turn the most um, simple of, of structures or um, even places of great sorrow into places of, um, and, uh, and great devastation into places that are sacred, of course, as well. 
So, um, because human suffering is also um, sacred. So, uh, it's a pretty broad spectrum. <laughs> um, but again, there's the, the energy going out and the energy coming in and which is more, um, and which, which is more helpful in which kind of a space understanding that. So um, that's, that's my thoughts on creating sacred space. Thank you very much for that. And now what are your thoughts on creating sacred community in groups uh, when participating and when leading? I imagine you're leading more than you're participating, but maybe not. Um, in groups, yeah, I'm generally leading, um, which <laughs> probably a good thing because um i i have a um i i yeah with my having had a nervous breakdown i have a, a natural um discomfort around large groups of people unless i'm on stage <laughs> um i find my, or unless i'm teaching I find myself a little overwhelmed. I, I, I do teach and I have taught large numbers as well, although I prefer to, to, to cap it at about 30 people so I can really be with everybody individually. Um, uh, so it's what I do and I do it in all ways that I can. So everything that you said in the question, all of those ways, all of those things, I'm just you know, that's just go out and do it and, and participate and lead and, and um, be involved as, as much as possible. Um, so um, the, the ways that are important to me uh, around this are, A, is to meet people where they are. So if it's an audience or it's a situation where it's a performance, then you meet that, you meet that ritual. If you are teaching, you, you meet people where they are. Do you have dancers of extraordinary excellence who are perfection and, and you have to almost ground them and keep them on the planet? Or do you have, are you working with people who are, are injured? Most of us are anyway. Uh, and or, or what, what is the group? What is the structure? Who's there? Who's in the room? And how do you meet people uh, where they are. I find diversity in a group really helpful because then people who have a, a high level of, of nuance and quality and excellence, our facility, really uh, find their humanity. And those that do not have facility use their humanity and their energy to really temper the, the group. So I like, I like, um, I like diverse uh, uh, levels of physical um, abilities are, are really, I, I find that can be really helpful for a group, but I also work with people in, in different things. But to meet people where they are, what are their problems, what are their joys, where are we going, what are we doing? Um, so physically, I'll, I'll look at everybody and I'll see what we can do and I'll apply small exercises and meditation movements to get people moving. I don't give uh, structured movement, I give um, I, I talk people through movement, I give them metaphor and ideas, and um, this shows where they're injured or hit or have troubles or where they are in their consciousness, which can generally help me understand quickly if people have been uh, um, uh, injured, if they've, if they've suffered abuse or rape or, or things like that, working with people in trauma situations who have been through trauma. But I don't do talk therapy. I look at it literally from where the body is injured and how do we get the body into a healthy dynamic uh, between too flaccid and you have no rigor too rigid and too strong and you break. So uh, health is the ability to have an elasticity between those and then finding how to get people working with their own elasticity so they broaden, they broaden the embrace uh, between those two contrasts. So, so getting their health uh, in physicality is really, really important. So I also like to guide them into a relationship with experiential wisdom. Uh, in other words, understanding that uh, their thought, emotion, spirituality, 
uh, intellect, the, uh, the body, it's all interconnected. And what are the architectures that the inner architecture creates on the outside? So how do we even fuse ourselves more back into, into um, going with the flow of our own life and our own thoughts and our own feelings and just kind of getting into a, a, a fluidity uh, that, that, that is healthy and is cognizant that also brings into mind the idea of the third person so that you uh, get an overview of yourself as you are being yourself and as you are being yourself in motion. Uh, which can be most helpful. So you remove from the you you rem, you 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 get a, a perspective on yourself, a third person vision that can be most most helpful in terms of going into the transformative phase. So that if you think of it from a, a muscle uh, that is got scar tissue or is stuck, and you're trying to open that stuckness, you're trying to get uh, fluidity and flexibility into the body, you're trying to get fluidity and flexibility into the emotions that are stuck or have scar tissue uh, so that they too can ease. You're trying to get it also intellectually, you want your brain to breathe um, and uh, your mind to breathe and thought, certain thoughts you want to lose, as they would, uh, I think it's Helen Lucas that said, we need to loosen the, the uh, shackles of ideology if we're going to move forward in these times. So yay, yay on that and yay on her and let's do that physically and let's do, and let that affect the spirituality. So I really go at it from a movement vantage point. So if I'm working with somebody who I discover is not um, uh, in their body, they're either in the front of their body or behind their body, their consciousness, is not held within the the uh, the body, the torso, the the center of the body, the pelvis, pelvic area. If it's not held there, then obviously there's been some trauma. So how do we add into add into that by introducing new ideas? So I don't tell people to get rid of anything. I just introduce new ideas, help them uh, go into the puddly pool of a new idea just a little bit and then a little bit more and a little bit more till they're comfortable with it and then they naturally can go back and forth between these two states of feelings which gives you an elasticity and then they will naturally decide which state of being is better is is good for them and usually they go towards the idea of health almost in in fact always in my experience um, once they have the option so you just you just add on to the story because they're they're whatever they're doing they're doing it, it it's a strategy that's worked for them or it's where they the strategy that's helped them cope and uh, sometimes our strategies turn on us so we need to uh, get an elasticity and shift that forward so I think of that transformative state as incredibly sacred so that's really important to me um, uh, body health, uh, so that's the, the healing, the mind, the heart, the soul, um, and the body, uh, but from the body vantage point. Then the other thing is that all people are unique. Uh, so because I, I, I've had the, I have a, an individual thing is to just uh, getting comfortable with the mystery is really important and the uniqueness of us. So like milk is good for everybody except the person whose milk's not good for it. or you know everything is really good for everybody except for the person that it's not good for. So um, uh, being ready to be wrong when I teach, being ready to go into the mystery, being ready to get people comfortable, un very comfortable with mystery as well. Uh, so during COVID of course it's, it's to become firmly planted in midair so that we find a way to feel into that mystery and allow it to be um, a safe or understandable place. So a lot of being able to move into the back body area where you cannot see and being comfortable with that. So a lot of these things are metaphors. As you do, you look for the metaphor that is going to serve the person, that is going to serve the, 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 the situation. So that's really good. Um, intuition and third person 
space and energy use is really important. So, learn, you know, uh, uh, I, I like to get people uh, both in performance and in uh, teaching uh, excited about intuition and possibility and um, curiosity because you can't be in pain when you're in curiosity. So moving into those spaces, checking out your intuition in a dance room or in a ritual setting is so exciting because then you can just check it out and you get to be friends with it. You get to be friends with it uh, because you're doing it in a safe space. Uh, so working a lot with intuition, getting people to, to be involved with inter, uh, intuition and um, energy, of course, the energy of the body, um, moving it out, moving it in, um, connecting it, uh, using it in different size models, uh, playing with it. And I find that the older I get, particularly uh, as my skin um, now, if a partner goes to grab me, I say you have to grab the bony part because the skin moves and the muscle moves and the bone moves. They're all sort of separating from each other. And within that separation, though, um, that aspect coupled with the aspect that uh, uh, as we were born, we move into the world, as we are getting ready to move out of the world, we see energy and feel energy more clearly. Um, Yippee, <laughs> points for aging. Um, and uh, to work with that energy and understand it and flow with it and be part of that dynamic um, and find it's where it needs to be. So some people have been teaching everybody or they've been running around taking care of people and their out energy is just done for. They really need to be using the channels to get the in energy. Uh, coming through. Some people really feel, have had life experiences that have so hurt them that they feel that God is spat on them. I had that for a while. And so I couldn't accept energy coming in for a while. I had to understand and find a way and, uh, and, and deal with all of that. And that was lovely, lovely, lovely. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, uh, so that, that, that is, those are aspects. Um, uh, intuition in the third person space. Yeah, we did that. So science um, has, as recently noted, uh, certainly uh, Stephen Hawkins, that our um, understanding of our intuition is actually our our decision making is actually in the belly. So I would I would settle my intuition in my belly as well. First of all, it's the center of your body, so your body can move more beautifully or easily in space rather than head-centric or uh, feet-centric. Uh, you move your hips, everything goes with it. So that, 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 that lower chakra is, uh, Stephen Hawkins discovered that that's where there's a, the spark comes and then that runs up to the brain. The brain makes the decision, runs back down the nervous system, but the actual intuition or gut response or your decision making is actually starting in your belly. So really good idea to, to work um, with the belly centered um, and learn to balance not balance from that place. Um, so that's really exciting to me. And then also another thing uh, about uh, um, science that I wanted to, to pay respect uh, two is um, that now we're, we're understanding that uh, freeform dance helps us create new neural interconnectors. So particularly as the older we get, uh, the kind of dance I do is more helpful for um, uh, growing intellect as opposed to rote movement. So once you hit your 50s and 60s and, and up, uh, not to, to balance your rote movement with movement that is just metaphor based. So you're listening to music or you're coming up with ideas and you're, or you're feeling what you feel and you're allowing that movement to happen. That's going to um, create new connections in your brain. So that's super wonderful and that's super sacred to me. Um, so uh, humanism to balance perfection. Oh yeah. So, um, Humanism uh, is important to me in order to balance perfectionism, which we know can get, get you off the planet. There's, there's a problem with the extremes of perfectionism. Um, 
And uh, as, as uh, I, I imagine, if you don't know, but certainly Francis Vaughn uh, wrote a definitive and amazing books, and I was blessed to get to know her uh, from a Jungian perspective on, on uh, the shadow side of the sacred. So learning that and being with that and understanding that and trying to temper people who wish for such a pure, pure perfection that they're trying to get out of their bodies and they're not embracing this, this, the whole totality of, of our, this holistic sacred of who we are uh, and I find uh, working with our humanity and playing with that really helps in bringing that sacred into its, its full bodied, joyful uh, balance and center and mystery and, and, and yielding to that mystery. So that's thrilling to me. Um, uh, lots of things thrilling to me, obviously. Um, also, Frances Vaughn worked, of course, with intuition. So great, 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 wonderful woman. Um, sadly left the planet, but woohoo, is she, uh, what, a, what a genius. Um, so how does the sacred manifest through movement? Uh, dance in your work or daily practice? Oh, that's a question, right? You're, yes, that's a question. I'm supposed to ask that question. <laughs> okay, you, so can I, ask your, you can ask yourself, and that'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, how does it manifest through your movement? Uh, just in, in uh, recapping your answer to question two, I, I gather from that that you really work with individuals when you're doing your community development. Um, you don't consider the community one blob of something that um, you're uh, yeah, bringing. I work with the, the community individual. So uh, my community is a bunch of, uh, I, I, would, I would call my group work solo, collective solos. <laughs> Thank you, that's wonderful, that's a good summary. Um, so now let's go to question three, and uh, you've asked it and I'll ask it again. How does the sacred manifest through movement and dance in your work and in your daily practice and in your community? So I have um, almost 50 years of uh, being a uh, solo dance artist and working with groups and being a guest artist and and and, so that is performing on stage is sacred to me. Um, uh, I have been able to witness and been involved in miracle after miracle after miracle and, um, and touching people and uh, finding ways to do that. And I actually uh, teach performance um, and I don't call it sacred, but for me, it is very sacred. I think that some people come to their sacred without uh, the word sacred can be um, intimidating and yet sacred it is. So, um, uh, so I, I performing my solo dance. I think that um, my, my daily practice needs more help. I get sidetracked by a lot of other things. So my daily practice has been a bit erratic, uh, but right now it is a movement meditation, which I do with the other dancers uh, with, with when I'm teaching as well, um, just going through the different, uh, different aspects of spirituality that help us understand mystery and be within the mystery and be calm and, and, and centered within the mystery, um, allowing for things to be chaotic, allowing for things to, and still staying centered, uh, allowing to be compassionate, but not let our heart go out of our body keeping the heart where it belongs, which is in the body, and so that it's available to, 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 to people. Um, so doing an active heart movement practice, an active uh, intellect uh, movement practice, which involves oxygenating the brain and relaxing it and um, for, uh, treating the brain like it's a jellyfish or an octopus and, just letting it yield. Yielding has been really important to me, right? This, this last um, yielding, but I wouldn't call it giving up. I would say yielding. Um, 
uh, releasing, so releasing this way, that way, releasing the hand up, releasing the hand down, moving by yielding into the space, as opposed to pushing into the space, yielding into the space, yielding back, yielding up, yielding down. So particularly for tension and for stiffness and for those parts of us that feel frightened and rigid and pulled away from what is living and vibrant and beautiful, uh, to, to go into yielding is, is really, really helpful. And um, for teaching and for in everything really is transformation, health, intimacy with the sacred, authenticity and truth. Those would be my sort of signature things. I love the word source also, but that's just a private preference. <laughs> uh, but I think transformation is the, the really um, where I live and what I love. And um, so I've done a lot of work with conflict resolution as well, or not conflict resolution, because there ain't no resolution. It's transformation, how to shift, how to, how to use aggression um, for positive purposes, how to be petite and safe when aggression is around you, things like that from other people, things like that, how, how uh, to deal with uh, intellectual aggression, emotional, not perfect. I don't claim to be knowing all of this. I am claiming to uh, be interested in it and researching it and loving it and excited about the, the, the sets of stuff that I have um, come up with, with the group of people that I do work with, with that, when I work on that, uh, using dance for problem solving, which I think is sacred because it keeps you connected to the beauty and, and what is living and what is earth and what is life and what is all, all of those. So, so as, as, um, as uh, uh, Hildegard would say, you know, veriditas, veriditas. I actually did a piece recently about veriditas uh, using some of the saints and some of the goddess uh, uh, archetypes and working with that, which I usually don't do. I usually do it from a more simple humanistic basis. But I guess as I get older, that was important to me. So um, again, transformation, health, intimacy with the sacred. Uh, maybe there's a thing or two I could say about that. So just feeling the space around this beautiful, for some people, profane body, profane sexuality, my armpits, the areas of me that are more intimate and close and feeling the air and feeling that sacred place around me, feeling the interface that I have with the sacred in my breath going out and in the closeness of the air or the thickness of the air or going into remembering um, that, that this lovely sort of energy field that is right around me, that, that sacred isn't always outside, but it's so close and so intimate. It's in the smell and the taste and a touch and a, and a crevice and, and, and working with that um, is, is particularly delicious. And then growing that energy into the cocoon around me, especially for COVID, the cocoon around me um, and using that and then then out into just before the walls of whatever space I'm in and then into the walls for stability then through the walls and on and on and on anyway so intimacy with the sacred and growing from there and learning how to allow the sacred to be um, the sacred to be uh, the profane to be more sacred to understand that aspect of drawing or what might be considered profane yeah. to draw that in. Thank you. And now I'll ask you, why do you do what you do? Because it's my soul's path. <laughs> You've answered it quite a few times. <laughs> <laughs> it's my soul's path. <laughs> yeah, that's a short answer, uh, but it's, it's quite right, isn't it? <laughs> it, says it, it says it all right there, yeah. I think. Do you have anything to add to that or are you happy with that? Good, that's a good answer. And then the last uh, question we have is, if there is one thing that you would want to convey to those facilitating sacred, sacred dance events or sacred dancers in general, what would that be? 
I guess uh, definitely transformation. Absolutely, that we are in the transformative process, um, moving from one state to the other, uh, and to feel for that, enjoy that process, and keep discovering it, and keep sharing with every time you feel a room get unstuck, remembering anything of going through a portal, remembering those things, those times inside of you that made you feel unstuck, um, and applying those, to, uh, looking for those textures and qualities, those arts inside of you, which is nuance, um, for, for feeling your way through those, I think can be really helpful. I think there's been a lot of um, conflict between community and excellence, and they are seen as antagonistic and they don't really need to be. So finding ways to make a, a porousness between excellence and community. And I think part of that porousness has to do with discernment versus criticism. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, discernment um, goes really well. Again, a Jungian, this would be a Thomas to Mulcain. You That uh, discernment goes really well with compassion, whereas uh, criticism, um, it's, it's hard to have criticism and compassion there. And discernment will give you everything that criticism is in terms of excellence and, and, and uh, clarity, but it will not take you away from your compassion. So you get that all embodied, keep it inside so that you can work with it, keep the body wrapped around it and move it out from there. And when you lost the edges of your body, get it back and then move from there. So mystery being firmly planted in air, working with that, working uh, with finding ways uh, to not be unsafe, but to be comfortable with discomfort, uh, firmly planted in midair, and healthy. Um, uh, so an on honestly looking at, the, at pain, death, suffering, empathy, and realizing that transforming from the effects of grief into the effects of, you know, going from one stage to another or going through as opposed to to. So you don't need to go to the pain, to the suffering, to it, but to go through it, to the empathy, through it, to the healing, through it, to those things are all very, I think, very helpful perspectives or very helpful scaffolding in order to understand as we, as we, uh, try to communicate both with the universe uh, and with the, that sacredness that we know as we try to experience that sacred uh, individually and collectively, either as a group, uh, even if it's group solos, and as a, uh, and, and in a performative state where you are just moving your energy through. I, don't think you should energetically go to an audience. I think you should go through the audience because you don't know what's best for them. Their higher self will know. So you should move through the body to the spirit behind, to the spirit uh, through, and uh, I, I find is a very um, helpful thing. So the last thing I want to say is that I always default on health um, because I, I think life is challenging and we get lots of super challenges, lots of things we have to uh, deal with and cope with. And again, those we go through. So uh, I am constantly looking for the health dynamic in my spirituality as I share it with others, how to go through the pain, how to go through those things and arrive at and grow. As Helen Lucas was saying, we have a duty to joy. Mm. Thank you. What a wonderful sentence to end, <laughs> to end that answer. It's just beautiful. Hey, Helen Lucas. <laughs> Yay, you for saying it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, another one of my favorite sayings right now is um, love, love, uh, love completely in the face of imperfection. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yo. Yeah. I have yeah. I have a question. Uh, maybe I can ask you. Coming from the chat, that says, 
someone was very interested in when you talked about conflict resolution and wondering are there resources, books, courses, workshops, something that helps people understand to explore that transformative process? Um, uh, there is a book called Seen at the Crossroads. Michelle Baron, um, I worked with her. She, she's a mediator. And um, I went to Switzerland and worked with uh, 20 mediators from all over the world who do mediation in different aspects. So some de-escalate. Um, one of the we had one of the wonderful three wonderful men, which is appropriate to talk about today, as we've just lost one of the men who did the conflicts, who was responsible for reducing the con for for ending the conflict in in um, Ireland. And Jeffrey was another man who was part of that group, and he w he came and. So we had people who de-escalated, we had people who, who worked within the war situation, and then we had people who worked on re reconciliation. And um, so uh, the reconciliation, a lot of lovely rituals. So if you can imagine, this was given to me by a friend of mine, uh, Linda Raven, who teaches Continuum, phenomenal teacher, talk about just cellular sacred. And um, so you have people on this side of the room and people on that side of the room facing each other and they are to walk and crisscross between each other and go to the other side. One group bows to the other and the other is to receive the bow and continue. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then you switch over as to who's bowing and to who's, who's not. It's very, you do it very slowly. Lovely to have some harp music on and just really uh, people have uh, profound senses of healing um, and amazingly interesting things come up who can allow someone to bow before them and still hold it, who can bow in a way and who can receive a bow. How do you receive a bow? How do you, a lot of women find it challenging to receive the bow of others. We're not accustomed to that. So, it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful stuff. So, so um, Dancing at the Crossroads, Michelle LeBaron, uh, was, it was a dialogue about all of those things and, um, and the interesting, uh, so I, 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 there is a, a, a chapter on praxis um, uh, that, that, that I could, uh, that, that has a, some of the exercises that I worked with in it. So if that's of interest. Um, you can also get in touch with the foundation if you can't find the book or, um, yeah. Hmm. Are there other questions? I am looking in the chat. There's lots of comments. You have been my inspiration, Margie. Thank you. I was a student of yours at the Espas Tornasso in Edmonton. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. 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 <laughs> a lot of thank yous. I think this will go down as a very important documentation of, uh, of these five important questions. I'll turn it back to Pat. Well, I, what can I say? Uh, Margie, it's just been so beautiful to have you with us this afternoon. And again, I, we all appreciate that you volunteer your time and oh. your energy to be here with us. I love talking about what I love. And oh, well, we love hearing what you love. It helps all the way around the block. Great respect and gratitude for, for um, the Sacred Dance Guild. And a great respect and gratitude to you, Mark Gillis. <laughs> oh, Thank you so much. Blessings. Thank you. Blessings. <laughs>